Well, I think we've got to understand that if we don't solve this financial crisis, it's going to be very hard to deal with issues like development, like climate change. Um, and so we, we have to deal with it. Um, I don't think we should kid ourselves, however. The consequences of the financial crisis are going to be with us for a long, long time. And we, we can't just keep talking about it. Once we get, once we get the financial returns starting to improve, then we've really got to start focusing on other issues. And I think climate change development are certainly among the leaders. The issue of water has just been dramatically spelled out for us here at this conference on international institutional gaps by Margaret Catley Carlson, who's an expert in this field and done and wonderfully articulates the, the drama of this problem. And it, and it seems clear. I mean, one of the points she makes is that, the, that everybody regards water as free, just as we all regard air as free. Well, in fact, you know, both have costs, right? I mean, the climate change issue shows that air pollution from fossil fuels and other carbon sources imposes an environmental cost on air. And there are, there, it's very clear that limitations on water, and some of them being derived from climate change itself, means that water isn't free, actually. And it's scarce, and it needs to be managed. And so it needs to have an economic value. Well. Since the market's not providing it, you need a government mechanism again, an, inter, you know, an international mechanism that would place some sort of value on carbon and on water. So the, it really feels as if the water issue is coming to the fore as, a, as another urgent issue that needs to be acted on. And again, there's, you know, it's not clear there are a lot of, there, it's not that there are no governance mechanisms on water according to Margaret, they're, they're too many, and they're all fractured, and they pick up pieces of the problem, but nobody integrates it, so there isn't a global water strategy. Well, my statement is obviously very broad, and when you're talking about the behavior of seven billion people, there's going to be variances, but by and large, uh, the major water problems occur where there's a very low value placed on water in the terms of the price that's paid for it or in terms of uh, strictures that emphasize the, the scarcity value. Uh, this goes back to the time, very, not very long ago at all, when we were only one billion, two billion people on the planet. And there, the ratio of people water resources was quite different. And so we could afford to talk about the need for water to be free or low cost. We also didn't have as much infrastructure uh, to be managed in the delivery of water. So it's a very tough sell because our myths, our religions, our governance, our habits, our, uh, our legends are all about water as the ubiquitous free substance. So how do you turn that into something uh, that is paid for sufficiently to finance at least the ongoing costs of the infrastructure and possibly sufficiently to reflect the scarcity value? Uh, it's a very tough sell uh, and it will take enormous leadership at the national level um, and really more leadership than most uh, countries are willing to bring to it. Most important one is basically the voice reform. And most global uh, governance uh, institutions uh, were built uh, around, uh, you know, after the Second World War II and reflect the economic power structure of that, that time. So in order to have a more legitimacy, which is a prerequisite for to have a more inefficient, more efficiency, it's very important uh, they must continue its voice reform uh, to reflect the current uh, economic structure in the 21st century, not the economic structure in 1945. Well, in the area of food security, there are many international organizations and initiatives that are trying to address hunger, uh, agricultural production, and agricultural trade. And this is the issue with food security. It touches on all of these issues, and it's very dispersed in terms of the governance mechanisms that we have. So in terms of dealing with agricultural production, we have the Food and Agriculture Organization. Food aid is dealt with by the Food Aid Convention and the World Food Program. Uh, agricultural trade is dealt with by the WTO. It's really all over the place. Uh, what's interesting, though, is that the UN has recently uh, reformed one of its uh, important bodies that deals with food security and coordination of governance. And that's the UN Committee on World Food Security. Uh, this body was reformed in 2009 in the wake of the food price crisis with the explicit intent of being the foremost body to coordinate 
global food security governance initiatives. So you asked what, what gaps there are in, in the global governance of food security. It's interesting because there are gaps in the sense that there is a wide range of activities and initiatives and organizations out there, but there's also uh, a new organization that's explicit purpose is to try and be the coordinating body, the, the glue that sticks all of these different activities together. So in terms of the gap, the biggest gap is I think that not enough people are aware that the Committee on World Food Security exists, that it's there and that it's trying to do its job. Uh, the CFS met in Rome a couple of weeks ago, in fact, just prior to the G20 uh, summit, and uh, it was it was really, um, it, I, I was there, it was a really exciting time where people were really looking towards this body to be um, the preeminent co coordinating body. The, the problem with what was going on there though, however, is that a lot of the agenda at the CFS was being predetermined by the G20's own food security agenda. So the G20, as you know, has taken on food security as one of its primary uh, goals for the Cannes Summit, yet uh, uh, over a year worth of uh, working towards trying to come up with some bold initiatives that Sarkozy wanted to see in terms of reigning in uh, excessive speculation on commodity markets, trying to deal with uh, biofuel policies, maybe coming up with policies on uh, reserves to smooth food price volatility. In the end, what we, find, what we have found is that the G20 has effectively decided not to do very much about any of those issues. And that is a, that's a bit of a problem because it's constraining the activities of the UN body, which is supposed to be coordinating efforts to, to deal with the crisis. Well, it's pretty clear that there are a lot of bushfires out there around the world and uh, a lot of issues which are global and not being addressed or treated at the moment. And so, you know, what I think really came through was just the, uh, not so much that there are gaps in international governance, but that just quite literally is a huge deficit of international governance compared to the number of global issues? Well, uh, I think at the global level, the major gap in, uh, in the uh, economic and financial uh, sphere is uh, an imperfect uh, economic policy coordination uh, mechanism. Uh, there is a good thing and a, a bad thing in the present uh, house, in the present uh, international architecture. The good thing is that the, the major actors, China, the US, uh, the uh, Eurozone, uh, but they have strong interests to uh, find solutions to the difficulties, to, to, to search for compromises, just like we have seen within the Eurozone. This is true also at the global level. The Chinese need uh, export markets, so they need that the US and the European Union maintaining open borders. Uh, the, 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 the US needs huge amount of uh, capital flows coming from uh, outside, and in particular from uh, uh, China, so they, they need that, and they, 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 they cannot afford to, 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 to uh, uh, discourage uh, foreign investment. They, are, they will be much better off if uh, finding compromises, for example, uh, when managing their own financial difficulties. And the Eurozone uh, could be in danger if the uh, value of the euro, which is, as I said, at uh, 1.40, uh, if the value of the euro uh, would continue to, to raise like it did in the past, it reached uh, 1.6 in 2007. And if we manage well, as I suggested, our financial affairs, it could very well uh, be that uh, the euro again would uh, rise at excessive levels. And we do not wish that because this would be uh, a danger for uh, the uh, manufacturing sector in, uh, in, the, uh, in Europe. So the, the three continents have uh, 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 incentives to, 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 to search for compromises and not exacerbating um, economic, trade, or financial difficulties. Well, in the area of nuclear safety, uh, after Fukushima, we have an action plan to strengthen the governance regime for nuclear safety. So the key there is to get the International Atomic Energy Agency and its member states to carry out the plan. That is problematic. There were difficulties about how far this plan should go in terms of making it compulsory for states to improve their nuclear security. So that whole issue about compulsory versus voluntary is still on the table and the proof will be in the pudding of this action plan. It looks, looks 
reasonable on paper, it's not perfect, but what we really need is states to get behind the implementation of that action plan. Uh, in the area of nuclear security, which is protecting uh, reactors and nuclear material from unauthorized access by human beings, terrorists or, or, or other uh, unauthorized persons, the regime for that is much, much more uh, diverse, much weaker, much more fragile than it is for nuclear safety. So there we really need to think about how you protect uh, nuclear facilities from terrorist attacks through measures at the global level. And that's incredibly sensitive because states think security is for them to worry about, not international organisations. Uh, plant operators worry about uh, secrets coming out if, if their security plan is revealed. So this is a much more problematic area even than nuclear safety. So the security area really has to be worked on. Fortunately, we have something called the Nuclear Security Summit process launched by President Obama. There'll be another summit in Seoul in 2012. So again, that's a working process, but it's progress, but it's very much at, a, at a, an earlier stage than for nuclear safety. So huge gaps in uh, nuclear governance um, in both those areas, safety and security. One could talk perhaps more clearly about where we need to go. Um, there are a lot of issues which need to be addressed within the energy sphere. Uh, firstly, of course, to maintain sustainability uh, of supply and to ensure the basic requirements to run a modern economy, uh, any economy, are, are met. I think secondly, it's becoming clear that there are access issues. The two billion who don't have energy, there's a, there's all, to say there's a moral imperative might be pushing it, but there's certainly a real need if we're going to bring these people, uh, to give them any semblance of a, of a life which has um, a minimum of requirements that energy can provide. I think there's a major shift in geo geopolitics, which is uh, meaning that different countries will source differently. There are concerns, for example, post Fukushima on the future of nuclear, which in some countries may need, uh, Germany for example, could lead to a quite fundamental restructuring of uh, energy requirements. Uh, more, for example, more offshore wind in the north of Germany, less uh, or maybe no nuclear in the south of Germany. So there would be implications for transmission line development and so on. Finally, I mean, if one takes seriously the climate change concern, we have to be looking at a peaking of uh, carbon emissions sometime uh, around, 19, uh, around 2020, uh, in the 20s for sure, and then accelerated uh, move towards non-fossil fuels. Um, we're not positioned for that. The technologies are partially available. They need to be developed further. And there are major developments needed both in the midstream, the transmission lines, uh, uh, development of new lines, new systems, new grids. Um, and a wholesale restructuring on the demand side, whether it's vehicle fleets, uh, whether it's uh, much tougher regulation on buildings, which is actually implemented. Um, and that means in some countries a fundamental uh, reworking of how regulations are, are, are set, but more importantly, how they are implemented. Well, look, um, Adil Najam, my old friend from Pakistan, made a good point in the meeting this morning in which he said, We've, we've made an enormous amount of progress on environmental governments. We have international agreements on about a hundred things, on protecting biodiversity, on deforestation, on, on fishing, on endangered species, and so on. And these aren't trivial, but they're balkanized. They're all sitting all over the world. Instead of putting them all together in one building in Geneva, which was the original idea, governments decided they wanted one. So that, for example, and I'm sure no Canadians know that, but the Secretariat for the International Convention on Biodiversity is located in Montreal. Some of them are in Geneva, one of them's in Bonn, one's in Spain, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they're kind of scattered all over the place, and it's very fragmented. They don't get any critical mass. They're small. They're all basically underfunded. So, and you've got these great big bruisers on the block, the IMF and the World Bank and the WTO, the big commanding heights economic institutions. There's a theory in parts of the environmental community shared by some governments that because of this unequal distribution of power institutionally, internationally, that the environment gets shortchanged. 
that if there's a conflict between environment and trade, the trade regime will always win because the WTO is the big 800-pound gorilla. So every once in a while, usually led by the French, appears this proposal to have a global environment organization, which would be the other end of the dumbbell. I mean, it would be a kind of muscular organization that could stand up to these things. And that's kind of on the agenda for this Rio conference. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think it will go anywhere. It's opposed by a number of significant countries like China and India and the United States. But it will get on for the discussion. And what I think it does is it clouds the discussion of how you might take the existing system and make it work better. The UN has a UN environment program. It doesn't function brilliantly, but it doesn't have any money. It spends $30 million a year. I mean, if you gave it the budget of the Ottawa Fire Department, it would function better. That's how small it is. So if you want to fix global environmental governance so cheaply and without a great deal of ruckus, give the UN Environment Program a whole bunch more money, and then try and get these little secretariats at least herd them into groups. So there's some that deal with toxic substances, for example. There's, there are two or three that deal with species. There are two or three that deal with you know, other aspects. So you could probably group them together physically and organizationally, get some efficiencies out of it, and make some sense out of the system. But in a way, it's a, it's a system that's been victimized by success rather than failure. We've actually been pretty good at negotiating international agreements on a lot of the outstanding environmental issues. But our capacity to sign things and invent little institutions has, has been greatly outrun by our inability to fund them properly and organize them properly. Yeah, I, I think the, uh, the biggest sort of advocacy point that came out of the conference is this notion that the summits are just too short, right? And um, I was just sitting there thinking just now, um, I wonder if we could generate some outrage over that. I mean, I think that was the tenor of a lot of the comments, was a, a real frustration to only have the leaders together for such a short period. And uh, so I, I think that, that that will be a good issue to, uh, to push, to press, that uh, they, they need more time if they're going to uh, get anything done. Uh, I think uh, we all know there are gaps. I think we had a good uh, discussion of what those major gaps were. Uh, I think there is a broad agreement that if we have a network of think tanks, which of course we've established here in CG, uh, we can work together collaboratively to, collaboratively to address uh, some of those issues. Uh, we also had a very good discussion uh, of the G20, um, unsurprising because of course uh, we're about to go into a CG, uh, uh, we're about to go into a, a G20 meeting uh, in Cannes and the G20 is, uh, is an essential part of, uh, of global governance. We were fortunate to have here uh, the Sherpa, the uh, representative, uh, the, the, the advisor, chief advisor, I should say, uh, to the president of, um, uh, of Mexico. And of course, we had uh, for a terrific discussion, which I would uh, urge anybody who sees this interview uh, to go to see it, uh, between uh, former Prime Minister Paul Martin and uh, uh, and the former president uh, of Mexico, uh, Ernesto Zedillo, which was a terrific discussion, which again focused mainly on the financial and economic dimensions of global governance, uh, but uh, it really went beyond that as well. Um, I mean, pretty much you can sort of pick your own hobby horse and then you could find one, I think, is, um, is sort of the truth. I, I guess you know, what one obvious one is, is just how you implement corpor cooperation and coordination. So we have you know, a very loose framework that's being de developed at the moment, and the G20 is part of that, but how you sort of put more meat on the bones. And we've sort of seen this interesting progress in the G20 where you've, you've sort of talked about surveillance, we can use this, the, the MAP process, um, the IMF at the same time is doing things looking at spillovers, how you integrate all that together and how you deal with this paradox I think the world economy faces at the moment, which is on the one hand, we're more integrated than ever before. The spillovers between international financial systems in particular, but also economies more generally, are more important than they've ever been. Um, and yet at the same time, there's kind of this sense that you know, we're not in an era of multilateralism anymore, that sort of international cooperation has declined a little bit, you know, in spite of the G20. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you sort of reconcile those two things? How do you get countries that it's in their own interest to spend much more time thinking about spillovers and coordinating? Mm -hmm but where it seems the drift is away from that. How do, you, how do you solve that issue? That seems to be the number one economic policy challenge at the moment. 